Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillo, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. So glad to have you with us today. For those of you joining, uh, we are using a Zoom webinar format. That means that our audience here on Zoom can't turn on cameras or um, their audio. We can't see or hear you, but the chat feature is enabled. And many of you have already started using that by saying hello. We encourage you to make this as interactive as possible. Your questions, comments, greetings, amplifications, all that are welcome throughout this program. I wanna extend a welcome to anybody joining on YouTube. We are live streaming and we'll be recording and posting this on YouTube later. No ability to moderate Q&A through YouTube though. So I wanted to make you aware of that. So it's a busy week here and yet this week, um, we'll be back on tomorrow. That's March the 30th. We have an amazing panel of leaders from several different sectors talking about leveraging the collective a commitment to advancing diversity, equity and inclusion within our communities. And then Thursday, the 31st of March is Transgender Day of Visibility. And we have a great panel um, and a conversation planned specifically on uh, supporting transgender youth. So just a couple of the many things that we have coming up, everything we do here is free and open to everybody. So we hope you're gonna enjoy today's program and we hope we're gonna see you back for something else very soon. Today, I am joined by my dear friend, Ryan Lindsay, who's the Associate Professor of Practice and the Chair of the Mental Health Concentration in our MSW program. He's gonna be co-moderating chat with me, giving voice to your questions towards the end of the program. And I'd like to turn the microphone over to him at this point to introduce today's speaker. Take us away, Ryan. Thank you, Janet. I get the lovely opportunity and privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Sharon Robbins who is joining us today to talk to us about, um, you know, what we can learn from dialectical behavior therapy when working with folks with co-occurring intellectual disabilities. Dr. Robbins is, is an expert, um, has many, many, many years of experience, not only working with individuals with intellectual disabilities, but also the implementation of dialectical behavior therapy. And so Dr. Robbins and I have spent working on many projects together. And so today, I'm looking forward to, to learning from her and um, and please feel free to throw questions in the chat. We'll, we'll be responding throughout this time and I'll also be collecting them for the end. So without further ado, Sharon, welcome. Absolutely, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I just wanna give you a warning, you know, up front. It's not gonna be um, a long and exhausting uh, data review. Uh, I know when, you know, I present people are like, oh my gosh, they're going to talk about research and all that stuff. Um, we're going to touch on a little bit, but it's going to lead us into why this is a pretty effective treatment for this population of people with um, intellectual disabilities. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, we had done a research study here at the hospital, and um, we were looking at the highly aggressive women. And we tend not to have, you know, typically a lot of uh, women at any given time, but uh, we studied 86 women and um, there were 18 that really had high incidence of aggression. And we wanted to see, well, what is, you know, what does this group have in common? What should we be looking at? And if you look at what I have highlighted, sexual and physical abuse, placed outside the home by age 11. And then 89% of this group had some type of intellectual impairment. So, you know, when you're thinking about, wow, um, look at uh, these folks, they're pretty complicated. And so uh, we, we were really interested in that group. So I want you to think in terms of trauma, being placed outside the home, and then also kind of having an intellectual or developmental disability. Uh, I was also involved here at Fulton um, in developing a program to treat folks uh, who had intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as uh, people with borderline personality disorder and no intellectual disability. And so, you know, the question was, do we create a separate program uh, for these two groups or do we, you know, can we use uh, dialectical behavior therapy for both groups uh, or what do we do? So what I ended up doing was uh, doing a full scale DBT program 
as well as uh, using a more focus on behavior. So looking at, you know, functions of behavior, et cetera. And what we found after we implemented the program were significant reductions in both self-harm and physical aggression, and that both groups responded equally. So it was just as effective for people who had intellectual developmental disabilities as those without. So this really kind of drove it home to me that we could, we could do this therapy. And uh, I, I like dialectical behavior therapy because it's, an, it's available in the community. So if you're thinking in terms of, um, you know, do I need to get some type of special treatment program? No, you know, you can get DBT services in the community and have just as effective uh, a response with this group. The third uh, study kind of information I wanted to point out was trauma. And um, so when we look at borderline personality disorder, we're looking at high degrees of trauma. And you just heard me say that, you know, within our hospital and within looking at the people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, you have high trauma. And so again, you know, that point of trauma um, is driven home. So we do see this uh, with both populations. And I had um, done an article with Jill Stinson early on uh, when I first started here at Fulton, and we looked at, you know, the intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, population specifically, and the amount of trauma in these populations was just incredibly high. And so um, we typically think of trauma as, you know, sexual or physical abuse, but these folks had all types. They had, um, you know, emotional, they had verbal abuse, uh, and then we, we don't frequently take into account the number of placements being traumatic. And so we had people who had, you know, upwards of 10 placements um, prior to being here. And so um, you see this type of frequency uh, within uh, this group. So very, very high degree of trauma and likely underestimated um, is what I've seen. So when we think of using DBT or dialectical behavior therapy, and I'll talk about dialectics in the moment, that seems, um, that seems to be the question everybody is like, what does that mean when we say a dialectic? And I'll tell you an easy way um, that I usually uh, talk about it uh, in just a minute. But when we think of our typical interventions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, we think of mainly behavior interventions. And so you're looking at um, very typical behavioral uh, support programs. And what this does, you know, I think the shortcomings uh, that we've seen is we always focus on the behavior. The behavior becomes the end all be all. You know, what are they doing? Oh my gosh, you know, there's self harm, they're doing physical aggression. You know, what do we want to stop? And we, we don't typically look at, well, there's a quality of life perspective as well. And how can we, you know, enrich people and teach them skills so that that behavior is not necessary? Not that we're just focusing on, we want this to stop. The other you know, thing we see with these types of interventions uh, is that it avoids emotions and thoughts. And so when we focus on that, just the behavior, we're not thinking about, well, what are they feeling? I wonder what's triggering this person. Um, we, we, we want to attribute meaning of the behavior. I hear a lot of times when people consult me about you know, aggressive behaviors, oh, they're just doing it for attention, or oh, they're just doing it because of this. And we, you know, we avoid that, well, what are they feeling? You know, what are they thinking about these things before this happens? And so um, DBT kind of looks at that for us. And then where does trauma fit in? You know, when we see people doing aggressive behaviors and self-harm behaviors, um, 
it really didn't fall from the sky. You know, they they had reasons um, that they were doing this, and typically, um, we see trauma fit into that. You know, they did behaviors that worked to to have you know to make them a survivor, and so um, we have to look at trauma history and what was learned, and then. Are we teaching people to recognize their emotions and to address them? Um, we've done all kinds of things with uh, helping people understand, you know, emotion and to recognize. We've used comic books, you know, and pictures of faces and said, "What is this person feeling?" Um, and then we we kind of spread that to, you know, what does your body feel? I see you turning red. I see you clenching your fist um, because it's real hard for people with intellectual um, developmental disabilities to kind of internalize what does that emotion feel like for me? Um, and then are we teaching people to be effective communicators? Um, you know, are they having to hit someone before we get that, oh, they didn't like that particular thing or, oh, you know, they're upset about that particular thing. Um, so are we teaching them a way to say things um, so that people listen? And then are we teaching them what triggers their emotion, you know, and, and learning this trigger from them um, so that we can start, you know, oh, wow, you know, we're in this situation again you know, are you feeling this particular emotion and, and starting way before that, you know, incident occurs? And then are we forcing consistency everywhere so that we're avoiding that, you know, blow up of behavior um, rather than teaching that person, you know, how to get more comfortable with change and how to say, I don't do well in situations where there are crowds and so that they can start communicating instead of us, you know, saying, don't put them in a crowd, don't do this, don't do that, that they can start advocating for those types of things themselves. And again, DBT helps us, you know, with skills for that um, so that people will learn those uh, types of things. So, um, we want to teach people to recognize uh, these things. Now, some of the advantages of using DBT, it directly addresses the emotions and the emotional dysregulation. Now, one of the things that um, we've all learned through the years is that, you know, emotions tell us something, you know, they, they, they function you know, as an adaptive behavior. So, you know, when you hear something in the dead of night and there's an unusual noise, your body feels fear, right? Your, your emotion comes up and you're like, <gasps> you know, and you're alert and it gives you these certain things. And, you know, when we've seen um, people with intellectual disabilities, we don't often focus on of course you're afraid, you know, of course you did this. Um, of course it's scary at night because of what happened to you in the past. Uh, and they typically don't get that reinforcement of, of course, you know, with the emotions. Um, and then the thing I like about DBT is that I'm not in charge of that person's, you know, behavior plan or that person's adjustment to life. It's an equal relationship between us. We're working together to help. And so I have to be vulnerable as well. And I have to be willing to say, I'm not sure what's going on right now. I, I can't tell by your facial expression um, what you're feeling in this moment. And so we, we have more of this equivalent relationship than me talking the whole time, like I am today. And <laughs> we, uh, we require this kind of information from people rather than me telling a person why they're behaving a certain way. 
And then it's a skills-based intervention. So they're learning new skills of how to be more effective, how to manage their emotions themselves. Um, and it's, it's where we want people to go, that movement towards self-managing and that life worth living. So they're making these decisions and they're you know, the ones kind of in charge of what's helpful and what's not helpful. Um, how many times have we as therapists kind of prescribed something and it's been a flaming disaster? You know, it hasn't worked. And so we have to, as a therapist, be willing to say, boy, you know, that was a flaming disaster. You know, I'm wondering what I missed here with you that might, you know, be more effective. What would be more helpful to you um, that I could do in the moment? So I wanted to just look kind of briefly at, at what the treatment components were. I'm not sure how many folks online are familiar with uh, dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, so I wanted to kind of look at that and why it might be, you know, those components are helpful in this group. So um, the four highlighted are the necessary components to actually say I'm doing DBT. Um, so you have to have a DBT skills group, you have to have coaching, you have to have individual therapy, and then the therapist has to be part of a consult team. So those are the four necessary treatment components. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why, you know, that is. So skills group are what we think about um, a teaching. Our point is to teach the skills. Now, if you, uh, I've put the references at the end. So if you see Marsha Linehan's skills manual, you'll notice that it's a two hour group. Um, when we do that here at the hospital, or you would do this for people with intellectual disabilities or people with uh, serious mental illness, you would not want to do a two-hour group. Um, so, you know, it's really hard for people to be attentive for that long. So we usually do 30 to 40 minute groups. Um, and we vary the groups throughout the week. So we have like a skill of the week. And so on Monday, we may teach the skill. What is the skill? And remember, you, it's, it's, up, it's upon the therapist to make the skill understandable to whatever audience that you're teaching. And so, you know, people will often tell me, oh, we can't do that because, you know, these people have an intellectual disability and they're not gonna understand. They do remember the outcome data that I had. They do remember the skills and they do learn the skills. Um, so one of the things that we've kind of branched out and done is not only do we teach the skill, but our music therapists teach songs to the skill. Um, we also have um, drama to the skills. Um, we may have, uh, in addition, some type of sensory um, art, et cetera, for the skills, so that all, all week long, you're kind of getting the skill and different tablespoons. So, so you're getting the same skill all week, but it's through different methods. And so I would recommend that sort of approach with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is that you get creative in the teaching of the skill um, and so that they learn that skill. Um, and then you also, you know, a lot of our folks with intellectual dis developmental disabilities um, have staff or they have family members. And so you're going to want them to carry that skill over whatever skill they're learning that week. You're going to want those folks to reinforce that all week long. And what skill are you learning this week? Well, let's see how we can apply it here at the house. Um, there's also, we do some behavior analysis groups, which is, um, mainly teaching people um, kind of what led up to where it all, you know, went into a disaster. So rather than focus on um, the aggression, we would back it up. Now, I will say when you're working with folks that have uh, intellectual disabilities, they struggle with the term backward. And so I found that if you're going to, you know, figure out what happened, 
I like to start with breakfast. And so if they remember what they had for breakfast, and a lot of people will, you know, we're all very food oriented. <laughs> and so we usually remember, you know, what we had for breakfast or lunch. So I'll start with something like that. And then I'll go forward. So then what happened after lunch? Do you remember, you know, were you happy or sad? Did you like what you had for lunch or, you know, what was, what was your mood? Um, and so that's really helpful to people to see how, you know, what triggered that outburst uh, and what came up. And, I, and I've seen both types. I've seen people have you know, get up on the wrong side of the bed in the morning and then things just go downhill from there. And then I've seen people do fine until this one dart, you know, just got them. Um, so that's what you want to, you know, have them kind of internalize. Um, mindfulness is a great tool. There have been some articles in the intellectual disability world. Um, there's one by Singh, S-I-N-G-H. Um, mindfulness of the soles of the feet. And uh, it was an actual study that they did. It was a, it was a small number, but of, a, of aggressive uh, men that they worked with. And they would have them uh, focus on the soles of their feet. Um, when you first ask people, so think about your feet. Well, Sharon, I don't know what to think about my feet, you know, and you have to prompt through it. I want you to rub your toes on the bottom of your shoe. Is it smooth or is it bumpy? Have you got socks on? You know, are your feet kind of cold or are they, are they warm? And you take people through this. Uh, and what they did um, with this particular study was they taught them in the presence of anger, you know, eventually, you know, they taught the skill, taught the skill, taught the skill. And then they would say, what situations make you angry? I want you to think about that. And then, okay, I want you to think about your feet. And so you, they got used to being able to switch that uh, instead of the aggression outburst. So mindfulness can be really helpful. There are a lot of fun mindfulness uh, things out there. Um, we do all kinds of lotions and scents and different things um, for mindfulness. Um, diary card groups are where you're looking at their self-monitoring because you want people to start recognizing their mood. And uh, instead of you trying to figure out, are you mad or happy? Um, you want them to understand because again, those moods make them hugely vulnerable. So if they wake up on the wrong side of the bed, then that's something that they need to be able to recognize and say, oh, you know, I'm not doing so well today. Um, I worked with one woman who, when she did not get sleep, it was, it was terrible. Um, she would attack other people. And so she and I worked together and we talked about that. Um, and we decided initially the best intervention was when she didn't get sleep was to stay in her room and sleep late rather than trying to get up and, and go through her day anyway until she got more skills on board. Um, <laughs> the coaching part, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, but coaching is all the time. You know, coaching is uh, day and night. Um, you're going to be coaching because you want people to learn how to manage the mood in the moment. As I tell people, I can do Sharon's best ever individual therapy session at two o'clock in the afternoon, but that doesn't help when that person gets upset at nine o'clock at night. You know, they're not going to, you know, be able to think, now, what did Sharon tell me to do when that emotion is so overwhelming to them? So coaching is really important. And then the individual therapy component, um, we have, you know, a pretty much schedule that we follow for individual therapy. And again, these are all, you know, individual therapy is available in the community. And then consultation teams is for the therapist. Therapists can get overwhelmed with some of the severe behaviors and, and some of the um, lovely things that people say to us. And we need help. You know, we need help, we need support, um, we need, you know, someone to help us figure out the puzzle. And so uh, consultation is very helpful. And then 
One of the things um, I struggled with most, and I will say I come from a behavioral background and uh, I started out in uh, developmental disability services. And so I was very, very, very behavioral and that's um, very much my focus. And so when I first started doing DBT, I struggled with accepting and changing. Um, I thought every individual therapy session should have an outcome and it should be changed and it should be positive. We should, you know, we should have this positive type of uh, thing going on. And I had to learn that I need to listen first and I need to accept what this person's saying so that I can build a good relationship before I then start pushing them to do something different. And, you know, if you think in terms of acceptance versus change, you know, let's, let's say that um, your best friend comes over and says, you know, my significant other just dumped me. Would the first thing out of your mouth as their best friend be, oh, that's awful, I can't believe that, or would it be, oh, well, you can just get another person. And so that's kind of the difference between accepting and changing. When you move to change and when you say, oh, you can just get another person, that, that uh, friend of yours feels invalidated, feels like, well, they don't understand you know, what I'm going through here. And so I really had to get on board with that. I got to understand where they're coming from first before I can then push to change the behavior. And so it's a really important component in DBT is understanding, you know, when am I jumping so far ahead and trying to get them to do something different when I'm not even sure about, you know, what's going on here. So accepting and changing. So I just want to briefly talk about um, some of the characteristics that you see with people who have, you know, some emotion dysregulation. Um, for them, it's biologically different. And so they feel their emotions stronger. Um, we do see this with uh, trauma histories. We see this uh, with brain differences. And so we see this a lot in uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They have these um, painful experiences they've come up with. Many times they don't have the words to describe this. And then they don't have the ability to regulate this. And so they've learned these behaviors um, as a way to do that. So how many of you stress eat? Anybody stress eat out there? <laughs> uh, this is what we're talking about um, is, you know, we regulate our emotions by behaviors that work. And chocolate, I gotta tell you, <laughs> it's one of those things that um, is pretty effective in helping us regulate emotions. And so um, we do see that dysregulation and ineffective ways um, to manage it. And then it's hard once you're triggered to pull away. And so um, you tend to burn for a while after you've been triggered. And so, um, you know, we have this every day in our life. Uh, I get real judgmental standing in line. And, um, you know, that's one of my huge um, things is people being inefficient and checking you out <laughs> or being inefficient and buying their groceries. Um, so I can feel myself when I pull in the parking lot already kind of getting emotionally triggered, you know, about, oh, great. I bet when I go in there, you know, people are not going to. And so problematic thoughts. And so I already lead myself down that road, you know, to to that emotion dysregulation. And then what happens to you and to your brain is that when you're really intensely emotional, it's hard to think. And we've all had these times, we've argued with somebody and we've gotten in our car and we're driving and we're thinking, you know, I really should have said blah, blah, blah. I should have done this instead. Um, so when you're dealing with someone with intellectual and developmental disabilities who has a limited vocabulary to begin with, can you imagine 
how difficult it is for them to put that into words and to describe what's going on once they've been triggered. So it's really hard for them uh, to think. What do we do when they're experiencing intense emotions? What's our most common intervention? How many of you would say talking to them or de-escalating them, right? And so you're kind of, um, you know, the horse is already out of the barn at that point. Um, so it's, it's hard for them to think at that point and we're talking. Um, and then they have trouble with impulse control. This is, this is part, and particularly when they're feeling something really strong. The other side of that is people will also over control and suppress that emotion. Um, how are you? Fine. Wow, I heard this happened. Yep, it's okay. Nothing to worry about. You know, and you'll get this kind of, huh. Um, so it can present that way as well. And then the, one of the uh, things that I see in the DD population is it can present physical dysregulation. Um, and if you think back to your childhood or even now, you know, when you've had a job interview or taken a test or have something really important coming up, you know, your stomach will get upset or you might get a headache, you'll be worried. Um, I have worked with a lot of um, people with IDD who will present as I've got an upset stomach, I need to see the doctor right now. You know, I've, this is happening, I must have something wrong with me right now. Um, so we do see a lot of physical symptoms and it's really that emotional overload that's triggering that uh, type of um, reaction. So what we want folks to learn is how to emotionally regulate. So inhibit uh, that behavior or that impulsive behavior related to those emotions. We want them to be able to act in a way that's not totally dependent on that mood. So what are some things I can do, you know, to regulate myself before I go on? And then self-soothe that arousal. Um, emotions aren't bad. We sometimes have to figure out how, how can I take care of myself? If I've had a stressful day at work, um, while eating chocolate in the moment might be really effective, it's not doing my blood sugar or any of those types of uh, health things any favors. So I have to figure out what are some things that will sell soothe. You know, do I need to light a lavender candle and sit in the dark for a while? You know, what are what are some things um, that will help mediate that emotion? And then how can I still be effective when I'm feeling an emotion really strongly? How can I refocus that attention? So I told you I'd come back to coaching calls and what, look, what that looks like. Um, I have taken coaching calls for a number of years and uh, with a lot of folks who have had intellectual and developmental disabilities. And um, they, they really help you um, generalize the use of the skills. So when they call you in the moment, um, and you know, at the very beginning, I would get the, Sharon, the staff, you need to call up here and tell the staff to do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, you know, I would tell them that's not the purpose, you know, of this call. The call's purpose is to help you figure out what to do. Not for me to do for, it's for you to learn how to do. And so, you want them to learn in the moment how to manage whatever's happening. And uh, it is outcome and application oriented. So you're not there to fix it for them. You're not there to call staff. You're not there to um, you know, help those types of ways. You are help for skills. So let's talk about a skill that you think might work well in this. And I'll talk with people about, you know, out of a one to a 10, if you were to rate your anger right now, where would it be? And so if they rate it really high, I know I've got to use a skill or suggest a skill that's going to be more physically effective for them. So, you know, maybe splashing some water in their face 
um, maybe wrapping themselves in a weighted blanket, um, some of these types of things that would be helpful. Um, and then sometimes, you know, they'll call me and tell me that they've had a good day. And I will then use that chance to say, well, what skills did you use to have this good day? And again, you know, reinforcing that um, they can manage this and they can manage this difficult situation. One of the myths that I get from people who are like, we can't be on call, um, is that they're gonna call me all the time. And they actually don't. They actually are reluctant to bother you. I've had people tell me, you know, I don't want to bother you at home, Sharon. Uh, and um, fortunately, my dog barks uh, a lot. And I guess that's fortunately slash unfortunately. But a lot of folks who call me get really distracted by my dog. And so it's a wonderful skill when people are really angry for my dog to bark. <laughs> so, because that's a distract skill and we teach distraction uh, skills with DBT. And so, you know, that's just a, a, a simple one um, that we use. And so um, I'll help people on the phone. Wow, it seems like the dog really worked. He barked and you asked me about the dog and you, you seem like you're really calm now. Yeah, and so we'll talk about ways that they can distract themselves in their own environment um, with that. So I told you I'd get to dialectics and I, I love the line and most of the clients I do therapy will, with will roll their eyes because um, I'll tell them I'm gonna bring the line out. <laughs> and so um, I get the eye roll and it's, um, one of the ways I use it is to get unstuck. And so we, we frequently get in this with anybody. I particularly use it for people that um, kind of go out on the extremes. All the staff are mean, they're hateful, you know? And of course the other side of that, which when we get defensive, you know, as staff, we'll say no staff are mean. And so we, we end up getting this polarization, you know, between uh, our client and us. And this is helpful um, when you're stuck in a crisis. And so um, I usually will bring out the line and I'll say, where are you on this right now? You know, it sounds to me kind of like you're, you're stuck over here with the all staff remain. And then they're able to say, well, well, Susie's not, and, and I like Joe sometimes. And so we'll start moving that dot over and start really seeing that, that there's a middle to all of this. It doesn't have to be um, this extreme. Um, I hate my mother. I love my mother. I had a client who would do this and he would call me for coaching and he would say, please, um, tell my mother I will never talk to her again. I don't want to talk with her. Um, and then two days later, why can't I talk to my mother? <laughs> you know? And so he would go back and forth. And I brought this line out with him and we talked about what behaviors does your mother do when you have this thought of I hate her? And she was also uh, mentally ill and he really struggled when she was mentally ill because she would say uh, things that weren't very helpful to him. And so when she wasn't and she was you know, more balanced, he then felt like he could talk with her. So we fleshed this out about, you know, this is your choice. You know, when you're, when you're seeing that she's really struggling, you know, telling her that I can't talk to you right now because I can see you're struggling is probably much more effective than saying, I hate her, I don't wanna ever talk to her again. And so you're not ruling out that. Uh, and then another one I see frequently is, I wanna go now and they never let me go. <laughs> so um, again, you wanna bring in, where are you on the line? Are you all the way over? Are you in the middle? Are you on the other side? Um, and let's see, waiting is one of the most, um, difficult things I've seen with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 
waiting for packages, waiting for mail, waiting for, you know, things to happen. So um, I'll frequently, you know, try to bring that out. Where do you think you are on that? So I, I love using the line. I use the line with staff as well. When staff gets stuck, oh, we can't work with this person. <laughs> and this person is the most fabulous client I've ever had. And so we'll talk about, you know, those extremes um, in our thinking. And so I, I love the line. I use it a lot. It's a good way to kind of bring it out and get unstuck with people. Um, I wanted to just, you know, bring in the skills modules. The skills that we teach, there are two sets of acceptance and two sets of change. So kind of accepting that emotion, our situation, or the mindfulness and the distress tolerance. How many of you have to tolerate distress at times in your life? I think everybody has that. We have skills for those. Uh, and then the change ones, like regulating that emotion are being more effective in communicating with other people. Um, I had a woman call me and she had developmental disabilities and she called me for coaching and she was yelling at me over the phone and telling me that her big toe hurt. And I said, oh, you know, have you talked with a nurse about it? Yes, I just had surgery on it. Okay, so have you asked for something for pain? Yes, I've done that. They gave it to me. And so your toes hurting. Yes. You know, and she's yelling at me on the phone. And so we ended up and I didn't feel good about the coaching call. I thought, wow, that was not, you know, that was a flaming disaster on my part. I, I don't think I was very patient with this behavior. And so I went back to her and talked to her the next day. And I said, you know, I feel really bad about that. I don't think I was very effective, you know, in coaching you last night. What was your expectation of me? You know, in that moment when you were demanding that I do something, what were you expecting from me? I said, I'm not the magic toe fairy. You know, I can't come in and make the pain go away. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know, what you wanted me to do. And so we talked through some of the distress tolerance skills and she agreed. It was that situation where she, she had to um, tolerate the distress. And it was a real good experience because from that point on, I, I would ask her, is this a toe situation? And she'd remember that. And she'd say, yeah, so I need to use some distress tolerance, uh, Sharon. And I would say, yes. So that's kind of, you know, the different modules. Now, one of the things, since this is community conversations and the way that I like um, to look at this is, when we intervene with people, whether it be in the community um, or um, anywhere else, we have to notice that dysregulation. And so instead of yelling at the person, and I've you know participated in a number of interventions, our first um, thing that we go to is typically saying their name over and over again, Joe, 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 Joe. And you have 15 people kind of saying that at the same time. And you can't do that. <laughs> that doesn't work. So one person has to notice, wow, I noticed that they're, they're pacing and their fists, you know, are balled up. I need to focus on that. Gosh, I see you pacing. What's going on? You know, would you talk to me about it? I can, I can see it. And they may say something like, you know, I just got news that I'm not getting to go blah, blah, blah. You want to validate that. Ah, I get it. You're feeling angry about that. That makes total sense when that happened. Because your goal is not to prevent aggression. Your goal is to reduce emotional dysregulation. And so by recognizing the dysregulation and by naming it and by saying I'm noticing this, you'll see that person start to relax in their shoulders. And when I see that, then I'll move, well, have you tried any skills in managing how you're feeling right now? You know, have you worked on anything? And then we'll suggest skills and I'll keep that validation. Anytime they start looking upset, I'll keep that up again. Um, I do ask people, are they safe? Because I wanna validate myself. 
You know, if I'm worried that I'm not safe in that moment, then I'm going to look different and I'm going to look stressed. So I usually ask them, I just need to ask you this. Am I safe right now with you? And a lot of times it'll, it'll get a check of, well, yeah, you're safe. And I say, well, good. I just wanted to know how angry, you know, you are at this point. But I don't say anger is bad or you shouldn't feel angry. So this is a good little protocol when you're in the community to use with people that are upset. Um, it's very DBT-ish and uh, hopefully it will help you out. And so these are the two manuals uh, from Marshall Linehan for DBT. Um, so if you need the references for those, um, that's, that's them. Um, and there are a variety of, of things online that you can reference to get good ideas for how to teach the skills and things like that. It's, it's a bunch of data. But I wanted to wrap up, it gives us about 15 minutes uh, for questions. I figured people would have uh, some questions, but um, it was a pleasure being with you today. And um, Ryan and Janet, I assume y'all will manage the chat. Yes, thank you very much. Round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we've got we've got a lot of uh, wonderful questions. Um, and the first one I want to start with actually has to do with who is DBT really for? You know, thinking about like not all human beings that have intellectual disabilities um, require or need DBT as an intervention. So I just want to like clarify like who's a great candidate for when thinking about DBT or DBT skills to be incorporated into programming in, in any way, shape, or form? I, <clears throat> I have found that everybody benefits. I mean, I, I've, I've heard from our staff saying how much they've learned from learning the skills and how it's made them um, a better, you know, better able to manage their own emotions. Um, I can't really, unless it's um, very serious mental illness, um, say a group that it wouldn't be beneficial for. So I, I like using them for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard people say, oh, you know, these wouldn't work for me. Um, I've, I've heard overwhelmingly staff come up and say, wow, you know, I've started using these at home. <laughs> so it's, it's been effective. And then kind of thinking about it, you know, what kinds of behaviors are, are more associated with a comprehensive program for DBT versus, you know, other kinds of programs that are going to have more liberty and, and using some DBT skills, but it's not designed to be that comprehensive individual therapy, skills training, skills coaching, consultation team, all those four pieces. Right. Um, I would use the skills um, broadly, and, and I say this because uh, coming from an IDD background, we use a lot of words, um, and you'll see different providers and different staff using different words that mean different things, and I've always thought the skills gave us that common language, mm -hmm. so when we use a distract skill, we all know what we're talking about instead of saying, hey, look, there's a squirrel, you know, um, we talk about distract skills. Um, and so it's not as complicated, if that makes sense. Now for the folks who need the, the full contingent, um, I would say um, when you're looking at people with intellectual disabilities, I have seen um, borderline personality disorder underdiagnosed. And uh, what you typically see is um, people with um, aggression and self-harm, lots of emotional dysregulation. Um, they get triggered easily by other people. Um, and you have kind of that trauma history. So it can be the pretty severe behaviors that you see. Um, I've seen um, the men with developmental disabilities um, diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder when it's really borderline personality disorder and you're having the same sort of, you know, behavioral displays. And so um, 
I, I would be very careful in my diagnostics, you know, and, and looking at all of that. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about, you know, these are skills we're trying to, you know, help people learn how to engage in. So motivation is always a part of that, that conversation. And I think about, you know, how DBT integrates commitment strategies, but then also a lot of folks might know motivational interviewing. And I just wanted to know if you could share a little bit about what's some overlap and maybe how is it different? I've done a little bit of both. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think the interesting thing when you do DBT is that you're talking about the dysregulation in such detail and the emotions. Mm -hmm. So you're really internalizing that concept. So when I'm talking to somebody, you have trouble when you get mad and, you know, they'll usually tell me, yeah. And, you know, we'll talk about um, that as, you know, uh, going to the movie theater and some people cry, some people, you know, don't do anything. And then other people just can't tolerate the sadness of a scene. And so I think it's, it teaches you the underlying things with emotions. Um, now I have done commitment groups and yeah. I had some people who were not real committed to treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we've, um, we've done kind of the motivational interviewing slash DBT approach of mm -hmm. um, talking about, let's list out today things that make us committed. What mm -hmm. behaviors show, you know, that we're committed to doing something um, versus uncommitted. And the thing I've found is that the more common sense examples you do that people have experienced, you know, like waiting in line at the grocery store, mm -hmm. you know, are these other things, you know, you're waiting forever for this package to come in and it still hasn't come in. Mm -hmm. um, so the more we can make it real and realistic, um, that's what I try to do. And I do that related to commitment. And my other part of that is I make that group so boring <laughs> that, it, mm -hmm. that it's hard to tolerate and people actually like I will back in the regular group I'm mm -hmm. committed and really um, because they get tired of every week rate your commitment and so where is your commitment today and and so yeah you can do so you have to get creative yeah and um, I was kind of thinking about you know DBT as a doing therapy and so you know there's you know, a lot of, you know, context where you're talking about, but how does DBT, how important is behavioral rehearsal and, and how often are you having to practice and like do that, do these skills with your clients? Um, a lot more for your IDD folks. Um, mm -hmm. And I do it a lot more anyway, uh, because, you know, people are going to have unsuccessful <laughs> interventions as well as successful. So, um, an example, uh, I had this woman who um, was mad at one of her peers. He called her fat and she didn't like being called fat, right? Yeah. And so she comes in, you know, to individual therapy with me and she said, Sharon, you need to tell so-and-so that I don't want to be called fat anymore and that he's going to get in trouble. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's a skill that you've got to learn how to speak up for yourself. And so we went through one of the DBT skills, Dear Man, <clears throat> and we did it several ways. You know, she had to describe her emotion, you know, and, and put it in very language. I don't like being called fat. Um, mm -hmm. And then she, she indicated, I said, so, you know, how are you going to reinforce him for not doing that? She said, well, I'll play cards again with him. You know, I like playing cards with him. And so we rehearsed it with me being the guy and saying, no, nah, I still want to call you that. And, and then we also rehearsed it with, you know, yeah, I get it. You know, you're upset about that. And so you try to do both sides of that. And it was, it was so funny because that, that had never occurred to her to do that on her own. And when she came back to therapy next week, I asked her how it went. She's like, oh my gosh, we're playing cards all the time now. He, he didn't know it bothered me, you know? And so it was a really good moment for her. And then I'm thinking about, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of clients myself as a DBT clinician and, you know, there, there are sometimes these skills don't resonate, you know, have you had this experience and maybe are there some, you know, some typical or common themes or characteristics of 
how DBT doesn't fit or doesn't feel like it might be appropriate? Sometimes we will pick the wrong skill for the wrong person for the wrong situation, if that makes yeah. sense. So um, sometimes the um, emotion's so strong and we've underestimated it. Um, I've had people that have had more of that flatter face mm -hmm. and trying to pick up on, on a phone call, you know, with coaching and determine how serious that emotion was for them. Yeah. I have invalidated them on the phone, you know, several times and have had to go back in and say, I think I missed this on the phone the other night. You know, is there a way, you know, because I can't see you, is there a way we can get this emotion across so that I understand? I'll try to do a better job in having you rate it, you know, so that I get how, how much you're feeling it. Yeah. I think about for, if we're going to teach about emotions, we have to be like our own emotional literacy has to be so deep. Um, yeah. You know, in the beginning of my career, I didn't know I was signing up for me learning more about myself. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking, you know, what were, what, what have been some of the strategies you've used to help you better understand your own relationships to emotions so that you can be a better clinician for the folks you work with? Yeah, you know, it's, it's been a learning experience over time, as you said, you learn a lot more. And um, I think working with more severely behavioral folks has helped me mm. be more tolerant um, of more severe behaviors. And I think that's a struggle a lot of people have. Um, one of the, you know, tougher things to see is a client that you're working with do some serious damage to staff or to mm -hmm. peers or those sorts of things. And you can find yourself in the moment thinking, how do I validate that? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I say, I get it. And one day I had that experience and, you know, I was just horrified by what the, the client had done. Yeah. And I had individual therapy with her right after. <laughs> so yeah. you know, I was wanting to put on my teaching Sharon hat and, you know, say that was really an awful thing that you did. You know? yeah. And, yeah. and I had to really pull myself back and think how awful a spot she must have been in to feel like that was the only behavior that she could do. And that's what I ended up saying to her was, I can't imagine how awful it must be for you in the moment Yeah. For, for you to have done that. And she ended up just crying, you know, in the moment. But um, I think that's probably as therapists where we struggle the most is when we see those really, really difficult behaviors um, and, you know, the willingness to use skills in that moment and willingness to find that nugget of validation, mm -hmm. you know, in that behavior that's um, there. Yeah, because it urges to correct and try yes. to control it. Yes. You know, and I think about the shame spiral that often happens when any of us engage in a behavior that we don't, we're not proud of, and that felt out of control. Um, that happens afterwards, and I think all people do that. So I guess that the, our, we're about ready at time, um, and people want to learn more about DBT, DBT with intellectual disabilities. Um, do you have any, uh, you know, some resources that you can share? I also have cultivated a little list that I'm going to put in the okay. chat here. Okay, okay. Um, just in general, some uh, resources for working with people with intellectual disabilities and mental illness. You have the NAD, and it's T H E N A D D dot org o r g. Um, they're actual and actually an association that. Um, produces research on both um, individuals with developmental disabilities who also have a co-occurring mental illness. Um, not as much resources as far as, you know, DBT and teaching, sure. um, but, you know, that's an area. And then, of course, the AAIDB, the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities is another organization that um, provides research. Excellent. Well, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share? It was great to be here. Uh, I love spreading the DBT um, mm -hmm. word. And I really um, like working with folks who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I love that we have some evidence-based treatments for them. 
Yes. Well, I, I just want to thank all of you for joining in. We had over 105, I think, at one point um, um, dropping into this presentation. Dr. Robbins, thank you so much for um, sharing your wisdom, your experience, and um, we look forward to spending more time with all of you in open classrooms in the future. Thank you.